Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of On Finding Peace. And I am Chris Shea, your host. And on this podcast, we talk about practical tips for helping each of us to find our inner peace. And I like to bring on guests who can help to guide us into finding peace by uh, their example and some of their wisdom and learnings through life. And I am very pleased pleased to have with us today uh, the author, Shannon Egan, and uh, thank you very much for joining us, Shannon. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me. Great. Um, So one of the reasons I uh, was asking Shannon to join us is she has uh, written a book that's called No Tourists Allowed. And uh, I read the book and, you know, honestly was uh, very enthralled with it and and, uh, really found it to be enlightening. Um, And I really encourage people, uh, you know, honestly, truthfully, go get this book. Um, There's a lot of of great insight into what you found in your life. And, you know, I I know there are a lot of uh, parts of the book that that I highlighted. Um, but can you uh, let our audience know, you know, a bit about yourself and, and maybe a, a summary of the book? Absolutely. Um, well, first, I just want to say I really do love um, the title of your podcast because, um, oh, you. you know, the search. You're welcome. Um, the search for inner peace is something that I have, you know, it's been a lifelong quest and will always be a lifelong quest and um, something that I take very seriously. Um, So I, um, a little bit about me to answer your question is that I grew up um, in Salt Lake City, Utah, um, which is a predominantly Mormon state, as most people know. I think the percentage Mm is 70% of the total population has been baptized Mormon. So Mm -hmm. um, that's where some of my struggle for inner peace grew up is that I had experienced, um, you know, not really a belonging with that group that it wasn't really, you know, my pathway to spirituality or whatever it is that you want to call it. And that I wanted to kind of find my own path and what would, um, what felt right and true to me. And so of course, you know, growing up in, in Utah, in this kind of a, um, setting is, it's hard for people who, who don't want to accept the, the predominant religion. And so a lot of my struggle, um, into drug and alcohol addiction, um, is from, you know, that, um, experience growing up and just, um, feeling a bit, um, humiliated and ostracized by, by my community, um, for, for not accepting their, their, their path. Um, and so that's why um, I wrote this book. Um, I, um, as a young person, wanted to escape the Mormons, if you will. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wanted to find um, my own path in life, my own, you know, create my own adventures and my own interests. And I had always wanted to travel the world. I'd always wanted to write and research. And um, so I ended up going to Africa as a young girl. And I had chosen Sudan, um, which is right below Egypt. It's a country governed by Sharia law. And um, I thought, well, I'm going to be able to go to Sudan and have some adventure and escape the Mormons and also be able to Mm -hmm. sober up because I was struggling with addiction at the time. So that's kind of the premise of the book is um, covers my two years, two and a half years in in Africa and um, why I left and that journey to find inner peace in this war-torn country. Yeah, and, and, you know, that was one of the things that I I found it as interesting, probably the wrong word, but there was this, you know, part of me thinking if you're looking for this peace, and then you talk about that in the book, you know, as you're searching for peace, that you go to a war-torn nation that really isn't that high up on their regard for women, um, like that was better than Mormon. I, 
you know, like how does that like factor into the, the thought process? Sure. Um, well, I think if you can take into account um, being a naive 24 year old who hadn't ever traveled outside the U.S., I mean, I think things are different reading on paper than actually experiencing them. Mm -hmm. And um, as a young person, I really, I mean, kind of some of the challenges that Sudan had, I really couldn't really relate to them in the real world, but they sounded exciting at the time, kind of like jumping out of an airplane. You know, I was very much an adrenaline seeker. I was also an addict at the time. I was right. actively in addiction seeking. So I, I definitely don't think it was, it's not a decision I would make today with um, a healthier mindset. Um, and then the other part of that is that um, I had, I really felt that part of growing up in my family felt similar to a war zone because there was violence in the home. There was a lot of, um, you know, disrespect for, at least from my experience, some um, um, things that I didn't agree with, with how women were uh, treated in the church. And so kind mm -hmm. of when I returned home and started working on my recovery, I saw that you know, I also chose a country that was in the middle of a civil war fighting for their religious rights. And so right. I kind of, you know, unknowingly, subconsciously chose this country that reflected very, uh, some of the landscape of my hometown in many ways. And so through that journey in Africa, I was able to do a lot of healing by seeing those comparisons and the differences and, you know, realizing I, I, I ha didn't have it nearly as bad as I as I thought I did, so. Right, and and that was one of the things that, you know, struck me because as a counselor, and, and I, I've been an addiction counselor for over 20 years, and, you know, as, as I'm reading this, you know, I'm thinking, like, why does this even make, you know, a shred of sense? But coming to that end, as you were just mentioning, where you see those comparisons, it seemed to me like the perfect choice was made. You know, I mean, for what you could realize within your own life and, and take away from that, you know, so I, I really did a, a 360 on that thinking that this was, in, in hindsight, probably the best thing that could have happened. Yeah, it definitely took many years for me to, to kind of have that hindsight. I had um, actually had a literary agent that had signed me for this book back in 2009 because I, I was in Sudan from 2004 to 2006 and um, even then that my agent was just like okay I just don't think you're ready to write this book you know you you need some time to have the reflection and and so only mm -hmm. when I really really started that recovery process from my addiction and had years of um, sustained recovery. So a clear, clearer mind, um, I was able to kind of go, whoa, you know, um, and draw the, the lines on a deeper level. And it, and it really meant a lot to me because I mean, for the most part in Africa, I did, um, maintain my sobriety pretty well. There were a few relapses here and there, but, um, the depth um, that, it, that the experience gave me, especially it's where I started my career as, an, as a professional writer. I started writing for the United Nations while I was there. Um, and having that training on the ground in such a hardcore setting really helped me to be a strong writer. And now I do a lot of writing for addiction recovery organizations around the world. So I write grants to help build evidence-based programs so that people on the ground like me who are struggling for addiction and seeking, um, you know, the opportunities to self-direct their recovery path. Because mm -hmm. I know a lot of the court programs will court order people into 12 step um, groups or different things or, or a certain treatment program and and maybe that isn't the path for them maybe that's not what they would choose is that we try to develop these programs now where people um, can choose they have a variety of options available to them right, right. Do, you, do you think that the book is the main purpose of the book to help advocate for the recovery or do you think there was recovery and your own personal journey or, or is that one the same or, or am I going to ask the right question? Um, can you ask the question again um, just so I can under make sure I understand? Sure. Um, 
Because you do, you know, talk uh, uh, in your book about kind of beginnings of your addiction and, you know, wanting this recovery and what you were just saying now and what you do with, um, you know, the grant writing and, and helping people now and getting into uh, the proper treatment of recovery. Do you view this more as a book about recovery and working through addiction or is this more so just your story or a bit of both? Um, I think it's a bit of both. Um, um, So, you know, I wanted to tell my story because I do work now for the national recovery movement and the international movement. I'm doing work for um, Recovery Africa. They're trying to build a, a a movement over there in Ghana. And so what a recovery movement means is really the idea that people are coming out of these shadows um, and and telling their story out loud so that other people can um, eliminate the shame and that we can work together as a community to eliminate stigma associated with Mm -hmm. drug and alcohol addiction. And um, when I was going through that experience, um, I I started my recovery journey in um, 2011, I believe, Um, And so I found that there was a lot of judgment within the recovery community that because I'm not a 12-step person, I'm not a participant of a 12-step group. And so um, because that seems to be the predominantly chosen recovery path, at least that most people are aware of, um, I felt that I was also ostracized and humiliated. And even in professional settings, I had attended a national training in Connecticut with a bunch of professionals in recovery and was told that I rec- um, have an addiction, uh, strong enough an addiction if I, if I didn't need the 12 steps. And so yeah. um, that in, in the book is that, and, and really what the federal government and the local government um, is, is really starting to understand as they're um, allocating dollars towards drug and alcohol addiction treatment and recovery support services is that they're understanding how harmful it is for someone else to decide what somebody's recovery method should be. So when I was mm-hmm. being court ordered into these um, 12 step groups, I was being further traumatized to sitting in a setting with a, a book that looked like a scripture and there's red marking and somebody telling you exactly what to believe, which, um, you know, the, you have these specific principles and this is what we follow and this is what the rules are. And it, it seems to me, it reminded me of religion. And so every right. time I would go to these groups, I would um, relapse and I would try to advocate for myself with the judge, please let me go to individual therapy. I, I want to work on some of these issues in a, in a, in a, in a one-on-one space that's not, you know, in a group setting. It's, it was my personality and what would work best for me. And I knew that and I needed to, um, my voice needed to be heard and it needed to be honored because this was my recovery. It's my life. I should be able to have a say in the path. So anyways, a part of these Um, This funding that's coming down from the federal government is now recognizing that. So it's amazing. They're saying we're recognizing that we can't choose your path for you. We are willing to allow you to have a say in your path and for all pathways of recovery. So that includes fitness. That includes meditation. That includes creativity. I I, I, um, say that creativity because writing is really what helped me to find my recovery writing in my mm. j- journal, writing it, writing my book and different things like that is what helped me to kind of um, work on my own path. So, so that's kind of where the, what the purpose of the book was. And also I love adventure. I wanted to tell my, this story that was so adventurous. They, Sudan was in the middle of the civil war that ended right when I was there. You know, I had an opportunity to go to Darfur and write about the genocide there. And I, I mm-hmm. really wanted to just kind of share that with, um, people who like adventure like I do. Yeah. And, and there was a ton of adventure there. And I, I, there's that part of me as I'm reading the book thinking, and what isn't she telling us, you know, you know, and, and there, there must've been so much, you know, going on and so many adventures that you went on and, you know, things that you learned that you, you just can't get it all down. Uh, you know, so 
but I, I like what you're saying in, in the sense of the 12 steps, because when I got into the field of addiction counseling, uh, you know, so much has changed in, in these, uh, you know, 20 some years. And this is one of the changes that I do like is allowing people that flexibility to be treated as an individual. You know, and, and not to say that I'm against, you know, 12 step, but what I'm also saying is maybe 12 step isn't for everybody. And, you know, I would have been kicked out of the field way back when, and there's still some now that, you know, would cringe at hearing this, but, you know, we treat people individually when it comes to practically any other illness. Why is this one so different? Right. Well, no, I, I like that point. And I, I think that, um, you know, it's it's part of, partially because the, the disease concept of, of it, you know, addiction being a disease and how looking at it from a biological standpoint, and what does it actually do to your body when somebody who has those those genetics, you know, how does it affect their body differently than it does somebody else? And so this is all sort of somewhat new and being um, embraced um, by a, a larger audience around the world. And so that's why I do think that we're so far behind in sort of how we deal with addiction. There's so, so many people who still think it's a moral failing um, mm-hmm. because we do such awful things when we're on drugs and alcohol, you know, because it changes the chemical makeup of our, our body where we we physically are dependent on it to the point where we believe we will die without it. And so we do these, you know, these awful things that are shameful and um, other people who just don't have that, that those genetics are, they're like, I don't get it. Why can't you just put it down? What's wrong with you? This per- this per- there's something wrong with this person. So, you know, I, I'm grateful for the work that you do. And I think that we're all trying to do in our own little areas of, of, trying to bring the help the puzzle um, make sense so that everybody can right. be on the same page. Right. No, and, and I totally agree that, you know, when the, um, you know, parody law was, you know, being formulated in, in DC prior to, uh, you know, the ACA, uh, I did a lot of, of work, uh, you know, surrounding that because, to me, it never made sense as to why we treat, you know, one medical illness one way, but addiction, which, you know, is a medical illness, it is still treated separate. And, you know, the, the stigma is really what needs to, uh, you know, go away because it is people struggling with an illness that they wouldn't choose this way if it were as simple as, well, just say no, or just put it down. Um, You know, in in my years, I never met a a person who said this was my life's dream was to become an addict or an alcoholic, or, you know, sure, I could put it down, but why would I want to, you know, this is a wonderful life. Um, That never crossed anybody's lips that I dealt with. Right. Um, you know, one of the things that you had mentioned, uh, in the book, and I have a, one of the quotes here is, you know, what, when you did relapse and, uh, you had wrote, uh, in the book that, uh, you say it, it didn't take away my sober time or the skills I'd enhance while sober. And you go on to what some of those are. Uh, I found that so refreshing because what I've tried to do with people in, you know, recovery is that, you know, you learn from a relapse, but it's not the end of the world. But so often people continue in that relapse because they are ashamed to go and tell somebody that they're a failure, you know, because that's the way the world looks at it. You know, so to hear you saying, you know, that, that it didn't take away that sober time or your skills um, because it, it doesn't, but we, we so often think that it does. Right. And I appreciate you bringing that up because I think it's, it's such an important um, topic in, in, in the recovery journey. Um, 
the one thing that I, and, and again, you know, not to put down um, the 12 step group because I really, um, I really do believe in honoring all paths. I believe that we're all different and different things will work for us, including religion and including, you know, the, how, the, the way you want to design your home, the way, you know, the car you choose, everybody just, we have a different makeup. And um, so, but with the 12 step, the thing that bothered me was, you know, this idea that when you relapse, you start over, you start, you stop counting your recovery time and you start over and mm -hmm. it's like starting from ground zero and then building your way back. And I just, I don't think that's a really accurate picture of what goes on because if I relapse now, if I relapse today after over six years in recovery, it doesn't take any of those. I mean, my brain will be so much healthier on this relapse then, mm -hmm. you know, because I have six years of continuous sobriety, meaning my, 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 my thought patterns have improved. I've been able to rewire some of the, you know, just the, the way my brain is set up. There's just, and my body will be physically better. So there's just a lot of things that are not true about going back to ground zero. And so um, I think it's important for people to know that, no, it's a relapse is okay. It's something you can pick yourself up from. Um, and it's something that that happens in our community. It happens all the time. And if we make it safe for people to say, hey, I relapsed yesterday. I need I would like to talk about it. And instead of being like, oh, my gosh, you did that. That's, you know, if we could just be a little bit more relaxed, like, well, I'm sorry that that happened. I'm sure that was really upsetting, but it's OK. You're here today. You're talking about it. And so let's let's talk about your recovery time and, and your goal, your game plan and, and see if they need support and then leave it at that, you know, no mm -hmm. starting from ground zero and giving a chip on day one. That's like, to me, I just think that would be humiliating for people. And I, I know a lot of people have said that that is somewhat humiliating to go into a meeting and have to take a chip from day one when they had nine years and had a relapse. So it's, it's kind of just maybe what your preference is. Maybe some people are okay with that. And that's okay too. Right. And, and as you're saying, you know, I'm not knocking the 12 steps at all because it works, you know, for many, many people. And, uh, you know, if that's what works for you, great. Go, go with what works. You know, I mean, the, the fullness of recovery is what's important to me. So what, how you get there and what works for you, Hey, you know, work it. But I, I, I really, you know, encourage you to keep advocating in what you're saying because we need more people out there to, you know, stop that shaming of the relapse. You know, that no one is perfect. Things are going to happen. We don't encourage it or want it. But if it happens, you know, what do we do to learn from that and move forward as a stronger person versus that humiliated and shamed person who may not seek that help because they feel humiliated and shamed. Um, that, that just always boggles my mind and, and I, I just don't know where to go with that. So I, I, I really encourage, you know, keep, keep giving that message. We, we need that message. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I, I've been able to um, do quite a few podcasts and it's funny because I realize that I'm always saying the same thing, <laughs> but I do <laughs> think that that's, it's, you know, my story is the same. It doesn't change too much. I am, you know, it's what people are interested in and my recovery path and why it's different. And, and I think it is an important message. And it reminds me of that, that national training that I mentioned earlier that I went to with a bunch of peer professionals who, you know, were paid peer recovery coaches. And the whole point of this training was to learn about multiple pathways in the professional field and how, as professionals, we honor those. And, um, you know, being told that my addiction wasn't that, you know, it must have not have been that bad if I, if I didn't do the 12 steps. Um, what, what had happened during that is one of the hosts of the meeting <clears throat> of the training had got up and said, this, I'm, we're glad that this came up because this is exactly why we have this training for people around the nation in this field is that you have to know that if you don't make it safe for people to have a different recovery path than you, they're not going to, they're not going to share it out loud because you just, you basically just shamed them. And so the mm -hmm. other side of that was, you know, 
because the 12 step community is so um, well accepted, everybody is okay with, you know, saying I'm, I'm, this is my path and blah, blah, blah. But if you're shaming those with another path, that's why maybe they're not heard about. There are millions and millions of people in recovery in not, not in a 12 step community or, or a group. And so it's important that we make it safe for all of us to have our own voice in our own life and to self-direct that. And I mean, I think it's interesting. It's, it's a challenge within just the basis of relationships that you may have a different political view than I do. And, you know, it's, is it better to just shut up and not talk about stuff or learn that to make space for one another, to have different opinions and different viewpoints and different things that, you know, um, that you care about and are passionate about. And so, Mm -hmm. yes, I'm going to keep advocating for that and hoping um, anytime I do a podcast like this, I always get people that write me from around the world saying, thank you for sharing your story. This is my experience too. And I've been, I didn't know there were recover other options, other resources. I only have known of the 12 steps. And so I also have used my website as a way to direct them to multiple recovery resources that are going on around the world. Right. And, and again, I mean, that is just so important because, you know, all of us are different and we have to find that path that works for us. And, and if it's the 12 steps, great. If it's not, then find one of the, you know, other ways. Um, but to me, recovery is recovery and, you know, helping to improve your life and, and be healthy in your life. That's what's important. And how you get there and, and stay there, um, I, I don't see why that's as important, to be honest. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. And um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, there's, there's a lot of cool things going on around um, the world and especially in the U S to help people um, come together and embrace one another in these pathways. There are um, a variety of what is called recovery community organizations that um, that states, some have many, some have only one um, where you can go and all pathways are honored and they have all types of recovery um, groups and activities and everybody you know, can share um, at, at where they're at and who they are. And I think it's a wonderful thing. There's also a national recovery rally that happens and they pick a different state every year where, um, you know, everybody in the recovery community tries to attend and, and have a voice to um, advocate for public policy changes. And we're actually having mm-hmm. it in my hometown this year, in Salt Lake City, Utah. Oh, so um, there are, it's an exciting time to be in recovery. There's a lot of things happening and there's always a way to be a part of the movement. So. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of finding that, you know, th- that stigma is still there, but there's also another part uh, of the community that's out in the open and accepted. You know, you, you're finding more, um, you know, people who are in the limelight coming out and saying that, yes, they're in recovery or, you know, that they were addicted to whatever. And, you know, we're, we're finding, you know, that they become very, very accepted as they're, uh, you know, coming out and sharing the story, which is great. But yet there still seems to be that split that it's, it's wonderful for them, so to speak, but not for my neighbor or my relative or, you know, whoever it may be. Yeah, I think it's a process that, you know, just being able to kind of do some work in re- for Recovery Africa in Ghana, I was able to go to, in, there, to Ghana in September and sort of travel around the country to understand and meet with the people on the ground that were struggling with addiction there. And their issues are all the same as ours. You know, there's, um, the the judgment and the stigma and, and over there um they you know like for for me growing up in a mormon um setting i was told that i ha- had a devilish spirit i was born with you know um a, a ba- you know all of that mm-hmm. and, and that's exactly what happens in ghana and in, in diff- and on a different scale you know they believe people are um uh, they believe in black magic and they want to like get rid of the devils and there's you know by doing certain you know rituals and stuff and so 
it's just very interesting though because in Ghana they're very far behind and they have a, a you know um, their issues are um, deeper I would say but what what's interesting is to see really in the comparison in those um, two it, between Ghana and the U.S. is that we have come very far but there's still just a lot of education that hap- has to happen so you have to consider that for me um, with my family my my parents were really embarrassed. They didn't want people to think that this was their fault. And so they didn't know how to seek help. And they didn't know how to speak to me directly um, because I was a volatile addict. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like, you know, there ha- has to be all of this education that goes on. There has to be support for families so that they can know how to properly deal with somebody and so that they can feel supported to know, hey, this isn't your fault. And they can understand what enabling is versus you know, different things. And, and it's also, so it's in schools too. I mean, so I think you'll, you'll ha- have pockets of uh, places where maybe addiction recovery is really accepted because there's a vibrant community just, you know, in that area, but then in just, you know, 40 minutes away, there's going to be another neighborhood where the addiction is a secret and nobody's supporting one another. And it's, shameful and you can't talk about it so I just I think over it's just going to take time you know we just got to keep plugging along until we can get get um communicate with everyone right I hope that answered your question I I would totally agree (laughs) oh no definitely and well I mean whether I don't even know if there is an answer but yes you did um so you know when you look at Practically, if, if there were somebody listening to this podcast who, you know, is kind of dealing with an addiction and maybe, you know, off and on and, and not sure what to do, what, what would you say to, to maybe help somebody, you know, who, who needs to get that help? And what, what are their kind of first things to do? Um, yeah, I would say their first thing would be to to know that they're not alone and know that there are a ton of us that have have been in that really dark place where it seems completely hopeless. Um, I, I am somebody that has three DUIs. I'm a felon here in Utah. I, you know, I, I was at, you know, working for the UN in Africa and New York and had this book contract. And I, I just, I thought that there was no way I could repair my life after falling into such a dark hole. I had worked mm-hmm. as a, 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 an exotic dancer. I had done all of these horrible things in my addiction that I didn't think was forgivable. And I didn't think that anybody would be able to say, wow, she's, you know, she's, uh, she has value. So if you, if anybody's in that place, I want them to know that I've been there and I know so many people who have and they have value and that you have value and that everything can be overcome. It's a step-by-step process. And if you can, if you need support, reach out to somebody. And if you don't have somebody that you feel safe with, I, I would encourage you to go to my website, shannonegan.com, E-G-A-N. There's a contact Um, form on there send me a message I'll figure out what area you're in we can have a a phone chat because I guarantee you there's going to be some resources in your area that will probably fit the path that that may work for you maybe you're into yoga maybe meditation works maybe you do want a 12-step group and I'll help you find whatever you can around your area to to um, so that you can feel supported on your path so that's what I would say and then the second thing I would say is to know that um, that you're, you have something to contribute to the world and that if you just keep plugging along, all the pieces are going to fall into place. So don't give up. And, and I really love that piece of, you know, don't give up, you know, it's, you know, in, in reading your book and, and again, I, I encourage, you know, people to go and get that book, but you know, there are a lot of instances where it, it almost appeared, you know, how do you get out of that and to see that in in the not giving up um, and, and finding that inner strength, you know, you're, you're able to get to the point, you know, where you are today, you know, and, and, you know, being a a worldwide advocate, you know, for helping people, uh, you know, when you got to a point where you did, uh, but yet, 
there is that hope, you know, and, and I hope people can see that and, and notice that if you can do it, others can do it. Um, in the sense that I, I would figure there, there's nothing that's going to sound bad, sorry, but probably special about you necessarily, but you kept on with that hope and, and that enabled you to, to do what you needed to do. Exactly. I completely agree. And I think that's important to say that there isn't anything special about me. I am just, you know, the somebody that I, I'm just like every other person who struggled with addiction. I um, had a, a really hard, dark, dark, dark time when I was in my addiction and nothing special about me, no special skills that helped me to overcome that. I only took it a Actually, it didn't even seem like in when I was first in recovery that I could take it a day at a time. It seemed way too much. I could only take it a moment at a time. And I just kept breathing. I just kept trying to breathe. And I kept trying to write because writing works for me, writing down my hopes and my dreams and the you know, what if I did get out of my addiction? Who who do I want to be? And and these different kinds of things. And so um yeah, that's exactly exactly right anybody can do it and i i did my the first two years of my recovery alone because um i my my family and i we really kept it a secret and so i would advocate um for anybody that to not do it on their own because it's really hard to you know you're isolated and and stuff like that so after two years in recovery i broke my silence on facebook and added myself because i felt that i was living this this lie of this burden and I that anybody was going to find out and so I just I needed to speak my truth that this was my past and this is who I am and this is my history and so um, I wouldn't recommend that I would say if you can reach out to somebody um, to support you on your journey Mm -hmm. yeah no very true and you know finding that sense of community that sense of belonging you know, is only going to help someone. Um, you know, it's like you say, if, if we can find people who are, you know, who understand and get us, uh, you know, that, that makes a world of difference. Um, and, and we are communal people, you know, so, you know, keeping that isolation keeps the shame and uh, probably is helping to keep the stigma going. Yes. Yes, it is. It is. And it's, it's interesting because I think the shame and the stigma is really in our mind um, more than anything. And then, I mean, I, I know that it's, you know, people who are not addicts don't really understand and they're like, well, I don't get it. This is crazy. But um, I think that because when we're in such a dark place, and we do these awful things and drugs really induce really negative self perception that it's not, none of it's real. It's all, you know, it's all an illusion. And that when you're working on your recovery and you have people who are like you working on recovery too, telling, you no, you have value. This is not, this is an illusion. This isn't the truth about you. They can help you slowly, um, you know, tear apart the illusion so that you can actually look at yourself in the mirror and see your worth. Right. Yeah, and, and th- that is so important to not lose that sense of self, you know, uh, and, and that sense of worth and, um, you know, in, into who you are. Um, as we're kind of coming to the uh, end of our, our time, is, is there anything that we haven't covered that you would want uh, to get out there, a message that you would want the you know, listeners to get from all of this? Um, I think just that they're not alone and that um, it's okay and that they can overcome anything and that there really are representatives in every single state um, that um, do this for a living. So they're, they're representing their recovery community and, and making sure people get connected to resources. So if you want to Google recovery community organization and then your state next to it, I guarantee you'll be able to find a non a non judgmental person that can that can help you um, on your path and it will be um, completely anonymous and um, so yeah just that you're not alone and there are resources out there for you. 
That, that's that's an awesome message, and uh, I hope uh, you know people take heed of that who you know need that help because the resources are there. Um, and and I, I can speak for that. I, I haven't been in an area where there weren't resources. Um, the problem is they're not always. Uh, readily known. So you, you do have to do a little bit of digging to, to find it, um, but resources are available to people. Yeah, um, you definitely digging sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I know you already mentioned your website, but if you want to mention it again, and you know, how best is it for people to get a hold of you, and uh, where can we find your book? Sure. Um, so my website is shannonegan.com, S-H-A-N-N-O-N-E-G-A-N. And um, my links to my book are um, on, on my website, but it's also available where books are sold. Um, so Amazon, um, barnesandnoble.com. I, I, my brain just went flat. But, um, <laughs> so anywhere where you can buy a book, you can yep. get my book online. So um, and then, yeah, and there's also my contact information on there. I would love to hear from anybody if they need support, if they have feedback um, on anything I've said today, I would love to hear it. So I really appreciate awesome. you having me on. Yeah. Oh, it is definitely my pleasure. And, you know, as I say, I mean, truthfully, I was very inspired with, uh, you know, your story and reading your book and, you know, really just wanted to, you know, encourage people to, uh, you know, get that book to you know really gain some of the you know insights and wisdom that you've been able to find, you know, so that you know they can you know maybe use that as as their stepping stone for you know helping to uh, you know change their life. And for those who are listening who may not be addicted to chemicals, you know, I, I think in many ways um, many of us are addicted to different things in life. Um, but your message uh, really holds true, um, you know, that we're not alone. We need community. And if, if we're not finding or feeling at peace, that there are people out there who can help to guide us to, to be able to find that peace. Right. Yes. And, and that's, I, I appreciate, you know, that you took the time to read my book and that you found value in it because that's really why, you know, anybody writes a book is that um, you want to share this, this experience. I mean, not many people that I know um, just pack up as a 24 year old and move to Africa and mm -hmm. in the middle of a war zone and <laughs> try to find recovery. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of, I just thought, you know, it was such an amazing, amazing experience that I wanted to share. I wanted to tell it. And, and I have people that I run into that when they find out that I've written it, I mean, I, it's it's nice to hear that, you know, that they have found value in it and some healing from it. And you can take little tidbits from everything, I think, in life and say, well, this is valuable to me. This has given me, um, you know, A, B, and C so that I can do, you know, whatever. And so um, I really appreciate that. And, yeah, if I hope that if you do, anybody out there reads my book, I would love to get your feedback on it. And, um so, yes, thank you. So it sounds excellent. So thank you again, Shannon, for taking the time to, uh, you know, share with us and, and for being on this podcast and, uh, you know, really, you know, wish you well in, in all the advocacy work that you're doing. And same to you, Chris. Thank you for having me on and for all the work you're doing in the community and um, for inviting me. And um, let's stay in touch, okay? Sounds great. It's my pleasure. Okay. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.